Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really glad uh, to see everyone, because this is a, actually a, <laughs> a very exciting topic. Um, I'm Sarah Klein, and along with Mende Yangton at NRDC and Joseph Reed at Rails to Trails Conservancy, I've been co-chairing the Transportation Equity Caucus's Federal Policy Working Group over the past year. The Transportation Equity Caucus is a diverse coalition of organizations promoting policies that ensure access, mobility, and opportunity for all. Members of the caucus include local groups from many parts of the country, as well as some larger groups with a national focus like NRDC and Rails to Trails. We've got regular meetings and an email listserv where we share information about all sorts of issues related to equitable transportation and opportunities for action. The caucus is coordinated by PolicyLink, and if you'd like to learn more, please email Axel Santana at asantana at policylink.org, and I'll invite Axel to put his name in the chat um, since I'm not good at multitasking. So the Federal Policy Working Group of the Transportation Equity Caucus has worked over the past year, and in fact, over many years before that, to advance transportation equity at the federal level. One of the key ways we do that is by engaging in the congressional appropriations process. Now, I've been reading appropriations bills for more than 20 years, and even I will admit that this is one of the hardest legislative processes to understand. The bills don't even look like normal bills. This is something Congress has to do every single year to fund the federal government, including the Department of Transportation and all its various grant programs. It's through this process that Congress makes the final decisions every year about how much money will be available for things like safer streets, transit projects, or even new highways, and even how much money the department itself is going to have that year to pay for the staff to run all these programs. So this is a really important part of what Congress does, and our goal today is to empower all of you with the information that you need to help your organization engage effectively in this process. That's why we're really excited to have Kyle Jones here with us from NRDC to give us an overview of the appropriations process. Kyle is Director of Federal Affairs at NRDC and an expert on the ins and outs of congressional appropriations, stemming in part from the fact that he used to be the Assistant Parliamentarian at the U.S. House of Representatives, where he oversaw consideration of appropriations bills. And just as an aside, I think that sounds like one of the coolest jobs you could ever have. So, Kyle, I hope someday we can chat about what that was like. Your definition of cool is probably not commensurate with the rest okay. of the universe, but I'll take it. I'll take I it. I may be a little bit of a Congress nerd here, but <laughs> it sounded cool to me. We're going to start with a presentation from Kyle, and we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A. If you have questions along the way, please type them into the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. So, Kyle, let me go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and I am excited to be here, first of all, in a place where appropriations are considered exciting, and second of all, in a place where parliamentarians are considered cool. This might be the only space uh, where that is the case, so thank you. Um, yeah, so we're gonna talk appropriations. I will say up front, on paper, this is very boring stuff, but I'm gonna make it less boring for you, and I think it's not boring because it's really important, and let's talk about why that is. Boom, here's what we're talking about today. One. Why is appropriations engagement important? To some it's self-evident, to some it's not clear. So we're gonna to touch on that really quickly before we get into what the process looks like, both in theory and in practice. It is a legislative process that's really different from everything else that happens in the House and Senate on the federal level. Um, we're also gonna go through key terminology that as you're advocating in the appropriations space, you're gonna hear tossed around and people sometimes gloss over when they hear a term that they don't understand uh, but sometimes terminology makes all the difference in the appropriation space. So we're gonna get through all of those that you'll hear uh, while you're doing this kind of work. Then we're gonna look at actual bill language and amendatory language and talk about the type of stuff that can be in appropriations bills and stuff that is not allowed to be by rule. And then we're also gonna take a look at stuff that's not allowed to be by rule that nonetheless gets in there. Um, you'll notice that the appropriations process has exceptions that abound, and we'll sort of touch on that as well. And finally, we'll talk about the key inflection points in the process, when they occur, and you know the, the best points to engage at each step along the way. So, why should you care about appropriations? Well, you're here, so hopefully you at least care somewhat. But uh, first of all, 
It guarantees that your priorities, many of which you fought to get enshrined into law, say in the bipartisan infrastructure law or the Inflation Reduction Act, get funded in such a way that they can be carried out. A lot of times programs are authorized in laws like that, but they don't receive funding at the same time. So you've done all this work to create this great program, but if it's not getting funded from fiscal year to fiscal year, the work's not getting done. Um, it also it enables you to fight policies and programs that you don't like by ensuring that they're underfunded or defunded. Uh, and of course, I think most importantly in this day and age, appropriations bills are one of the few remaining pieces of must pass legislation uh, in an era. Take a look at the 117th or 118th Congress, one of the least productive in our history. There aren't a lot of bills that you know have to move. The appropriations bills will move in some way, shape or form at some point. And they are a great way to make incremental progress from year to year on the priorities that you care about. And now we're going to take a look at bill language and, and, and how it's drafted. And folks might ask, why is this important? Well, you can suggest base text and report language to legislative staff uh, for general appropriations bills rather than just concepts. A lot of times folks go to staff with an idea, with a concept. I find that it is a lot more effective to come with actual legislative language that surely they'll play with, they might amend, but coming at them with things that are in more concrete form that I find, you know, I find that to be the most helpful way to advocate. Um, this way, you know, you can become a resource to staffers who look for you, not just for your subject matter knowledge, but also because you know how the process works. So they trust that the priorities you're putting in front of them are something that could be actionable in the appropriations context. So let's a look at the process itself. Now we're going to talk about it, how it's supposed to kind of play out in a perfect world. And for those who have dipped their toes in the appropriations advocacy space, you know that it seldom plays out the way that it's supposed to. So we'll also talk about how it's been working over the last few years. Uh, but it helps to know what the process is supposed to look like. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that first. So, in this perfect world, the president submits their budget. The budget that the president submits to the Congress is non-binding and it recommends spending levels for programs across the executive branch. The statutory deadline for the president's budget is the first Monday in February. I don't remember the last time an administration actually hit this deadline, and there's no real enforcement mechanism for that time frame. So consider it that deadline is more suggestive than anything else. I think we didn't see the budget for fiscal year 25 until March of this year, but this is how it's supposed to work. And then Congress is supposed to adopt a budget of its own. So in theory, using the president's budget as a guide, Congress sets its own spending levels, including top line numbers that it wants to spend, which the House and Senate Appropriations Committees then split up among their various subcommittees. Each House and Senate Appropriations Committee, they have matching 12 subcommittees, each of which produces its own general appropriations bill. Now, the spending levels that are adopted in the budget aren't law but they are enforceable via parliamentary rules in each chamber. And of course, there are ways to get around those spending totals that we'll talk about a little later. And the theoretical deadline for the adoption of this, what's called concurrent resolution on the budget, is April 15th. But once again, there's no real enforcement mechanism for this. Uh, indeed, oftentimes, Congress does not adopt a budget at all. Uh, you're most likely to see a budget adopted during a year where you have some sort of a trifecta where a budget reconciliation bill uh, is in the offing, that you need to adapt a budget to continue down that process. But some years, you don't see it happen at all. Then you get to the subcommittee stage. All right, so each of these 12 sub subcommittees in each of the chambers, they hold a series of legislative hearings where they talk about the subject matter that goes into their base bills, and then they draft their base text for their part of the 12 general uh, appropriations bill package. Subcommittee markups of those base texts are then held. They're often pro forma, and the texts are reported by voice vote, but sometimes you will see an amendatory move if there's something of controversy in one of those base texts. Now, historically, the House would initiate this process, go through the process on the House side, and send their product to the Senate, and then the Senate subcommittees would act, but this has not happened in a long time. Nowadays, the House and Senate subcommittees often act simultaneously, and at the end of the day, you have two dueling sets of appropriations bills. Then you get to the full committee. So the full appropriations committees on both sides of the building and the Capitol there mark up each of the 12 subcommittee products. They report them for consideration on the House floor. Importantly, when they report these bills, they include with them not just the text of the bills, but also voluminous bill reports that accompany the bill 
and they set up important guidance as to how monies of the bill should be spent. And we'll talk a little bit more about those later. Then you get the floor consideration. So for much of the past decade in the House, floor consideration has been governed by the Rules Committee. And this includes a robust and mandatory process, but the Rules Committee ultimately is the arbiter of which amendments are made in order. Uh, the Rules Committee does have a protocol that says your amendment needs to be in order such that it would not be vulnerable to a point of order on the floor if the bill were considered under an open process. Um, in the Senate, floor consideration, to the extent it happens at all, typically consists of an amendment in the nature of a substitute that represents the Senate's version of the pending appropriations bill. And an amendatory process for that text is held pursuant to what is known as a time agreement. I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, both chambers have rules against including new legislative directions or new policy proposals that are unconnected to funding and appropriations bill amendments. And they also prohibit spending over Congress's self-imposed budget caps that we talked about a little earlier. And then you have your two sets of appropriations bills. In this perfect world, you then have to resolve differences between the houses before these bills can become law. This can be done by one house simply accepting the other's version of the bill, or a series of amendments to the bills pinged back and forth between the two houses, or a conference where both houses send a small group of conferees for an official meeting on what should be the final bill text. They report back what is known as a conference report, and both chambers act on that conference report, and that becomes the bill that becomes law. But in the real world today, this is where things get really, really complicated. Uh, usually by the end of the fiscal year, which for fiscal year 25 was this past September 30th, they're not done with their work, so they need to kick the can down the road, and they do this in the form of a continuing resolution. A continuing resolution, or a CR, is a simple bill that maintains government funding at its present level through a date certain. And this is not a great outcome if it goes on for a long period of time because it locks in place obsolete assumptions, leaves new priorities entirely unfunded while Congress gets together and gets its uh, you know work done. Eventually, a compromise omnibus appropriations package usually is negotiated behind closed doors. Now, this is distinct from the formal conference process that I talked about a minute ago. This is just leadership staff from the Appropriations Committee and House and Senate leadership huddling, coming up with an omnibus package. In other words, all 12 of the bills in one that can be voted for in the House and Senate in an up or down vote. Uh, in this process, a lot of hard fought priorities especially funding priorities and funding levels are cast aside in the interest of compromise, but engaging the appropriations process every year is still important. Why? Because many priorities that were captured in the appropriations committee reports that I talked about a little while ago, often are incorporated by reference into the final omnibus bill. Um, in addition, even if you don't get something in a particular fiscal year, you leverage that work in the next fiscal year when you go back to the appropriators. Sometimes you have to go two, three years coming back with the same kind of appropriations requests, marketing them, gaining traction with them. Uh, and that's the way you do it. Oftentimes, if you're coming to someone in a fiscal year with a first time proposal, they'll say, well, yeah, run it back a couple of times and maybe you'll get somewhere. So consistency is really important in approach engagement. And even in a world where an omnibus package doesn't come together and you end up with a longer term CR, um, these CRs seldom are enacted without additional pieces to them called anomalies. They include some of the less controversial priorities contained in the general approach bills that preceded them. So if you were able to get a number of smaller, you know, pieces of purchase in those, in those bills before the CR came along, a lot of times you can see those carried over into the CR. So be consistent, even in a world of functional governance, which is the world we live in at the moment. Engaging in the appropriations process from the start is key, and that's why we're here today. So, let's talk lingo. These terms, you can throw these around, you're gonna sound like an appropriator. These are these are important ones. My first year in the, in the parliamentarian's office, I joined right before uh, appropriation season, and I had to pick up on these quick. So, uh, I'm giving you all a look at here today. 302A allocations. Already it sounds like inside baseball, right? But these are simply the spending ceilings that I talked about earlier. When Congress sets it, its budget for itself, it gives a ceiling to the appropriations committee. Like, this is how much you have to spend for this fiscal year. That's called the 302A allocation. Why is it called that? Because it's set out in Section 302A of the Budget Act of 1974. Um, so that's why it has that inside baseball kind of name. Uh, 
And that leads you to the 302Bs, which is from 302B of the Budget Act. Uh, this is when you take that top line number and you spread it out between each of the 12 appropriation subcommittees, those are the 302B allocations. That's how much each subcommittee has to spend on its bill. So the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Subcommittee, which I'm sure is of the keenest interest to this group, they're going to get a 302B allocation every year spend. And an update for fiscal year 25, there are also spending caps that have been put into law. Uh, this is unusual and not typically the case by the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which was enacted in 2023. So this gives Congress less discretion as to how much spending that they can carry out. And they put these caps into uh, place for fiscal year 2024 and 25. These are the defense and non-defense numbers in the act here on this slide. What does this mean? It means lower 302As and 302Bs than is needed for the bills that we care about, right? Why did this happen? Well, this, it was the legislative imperative to suspend the debt ceiling. You might remember the debt ceiling crisis from the spring of last year. Um, the debt ceiling is a very separate thing from government spending. It has to do with the amount of debt that the federal government can take on. Two totally different concepts. Some might argue that the debt ceiling is an unnecessary legislative control on assumption of debt, but we won't get into that now. Two different things that have been tied together by certain portions of the federal government uh, or, or the federal, federal legislature who have wanted to tie them together as sort of legislative leverage for suspending the debt ceiling. And for this Fiscal Responsibility Act, they used that crisis to get these uh, spending caps put into place for FY24 and 25. I raise that now because the present debt ceiling suspension ends on mid, at midnight on January the 1st, 2025. So this January, and I'm sure spending caps will come up again and they'll wanna try and carry these spending caps past fiscal year 25. Uh, most organizations I imagine on this call would not wanna see that happen. So I want that to be on your radar screens as you're out advocating. This is something that's looming and I think not enough people are talking about it. So bring up these spending caps and how they hurt the priorities you care about it, if that's the way you feel about them. Back to terminology. So we talked about the 12 appropriation subcommittees. Here they are all listed out. Like I said, Transpo, Housing, Urban Development Related Agencies, probably the one you all care about the most, called THUD. Um, the abbreviation does look like THUD, but please don't call it THUD because people will know <laughs> that, you're, that you're a newbie if you do. But they're all listed out here. Each subcommittee chair colloquially is referred to as a cardinal, um, and the chairs and rankers of the full House and Senate Appropriations Committees are called the Four Corners. So at the end of the fiscal year, you'll hear about four corners negotiations as to what kind of omnibus bill is going to come together. That's who they're talking about, the chairs and rankers of the full committee. These are the different types of approach bills that you'll see. There's the general bills. These are the 12 large standardized measures that go through every year. Each subcommittee has one of their own. There are also supplemental bills. They're called, they're called SEPs, and it's any appropriations bill that's not a general bill. And they're usually for a particular purpose, like disaster response or foreign aid, something along those lines. And then, of course, you have the omnibus bills. These are bills that contain the contents of more than one general appropriations measure, sometimes all 12. And sometimes you'll hear a, a smaller number of general bills wrapped into one called a minibus. Continuing resolutions or CRs, already talked about those joint resolutions that continue funding at the present level. Uh, pieces of legislation that are tacked onto those CRs are known as anomalies. So when you hear someone say, let us know your anomalies as the CR approaches, that's what they're talking about, the tacked on legislative priorities to CRs. Community project funding is the euphemism for earmarks. The reason that euphemism exists is because people have wildly divergent views on earmarks. Um, they're, compliment they're a complicated subject. They were uh, out of order for a period by protocol, but now they're back with various limitations. On the one hand, giving earmarks out to members does facilitate the passage of bills. On the other, it does, you know, eliminate some transparency as far as how money is doled out. Of course, some earmark projects are good, others more questionable. I'm gonna leave that debate to a different space, but so you know, community project funding is what they're known as today, and they are required to be disclosed in the committee reports. And then, of course, you have mandatory spending. Most appropriations need to be redone annually every year or else they don't happen. 
Mandatory spending is the exception. These are amounts that have been enshrined into permanent law, such that they're not part of the annual appropriations process. Social Security is a often cited version of this. Um, military pay is another one that's sort of mandatory in law. Um, everybody has a dream of getting their priority enshrined into mandatory spending. Really high hurdle to clear, but that's that's what it is. And then emergency funding is something that's actually going to be very relevant in the very near future. These are appropriations that are exempt from the budget enforcement uh, limits, like the 302As and Bs we talked about. Uh, these are designations that you'll see in legislative language as being designated as an emergency pursuant to Section 251 of the Balanced Budget and Emergency Deficit Control Act. And it will come up in the near future because we've heard there is a disaster supplemental uh, hurricane response base that's going to be coming up probably in the next month or two. Um, you'll probably see a good amount of the money in that bill designated as an emergency. And this allows that money to evade the caps under the Fiscal Responsibility Act and under the 302A and B allocations. So even if you aren't interested in the particular disaster, disaster funding that's being doled out, it'll be more money left over for your priorities under general discretionary funding. So uh, something to keep track of in the coming months. Now let's take a look at what appropriations texts look like. As uh, Sarah mentioned earlier, it looks different from most bills. Um, first of all, there are rules governing what can be in appropriations bills, and these rules sometimes are ignored. We'll talk about that. But here they are. There's Clause 2B of House Rule 21 that provides the provisions changing existing law can't be reported in a general appropriations bill. And Clause 2 of Senate Rule 16 provides essentially the same thing. In other words, Attempts to permanently affect policy or, or, or conduct some sort of legislation that has to do with other than funding the government is not allowed in a general approach bill. That said, prescription on legislating largely is ignored when folks are composing the base text of general approach bills. And this is possible because appropriations bills base texts usually are insulated from points of order on this basis in the House by the Rules Committee or in the Senate by some sort of unanimous consent agreement to facilitate debate. But the bar on legislative directions is almost always adhered to when it, be, when it comes to the assessment of amendments for floor consideration. And the reason for this is simply because it's a shield against the most divisive policy riders that complicate the passage of appropriations bills. Now you'll find these general appropriations bills are formated, formatted differently from most legislation. The general appropriations text part of the bills have no section numbers. The text is formatted into freeform paragraphs, which are composed of huge run on sentences that set out top line account totals. And these usually are followed by a series of sub allocations to sub accounts. This is a simplified example here for the Department of Energy. You'll see that 19.47 million number is the top line number and that 8.375 million underneath is a sub account figure. And this is sort of what the general bills lines will look like more or less. Another common provision in appropriations bills a limitation. This is saying of uh, the money that we've already doled out, there are limitations on how it can be spent. Here's an example. None of the funds provided in this act may be used for the Shasta Dam and Reservoir Enlargement Project. So these are sort of gates on the money that's going out the door. Note that these often contain otherwise barred legislative directions. Like here, the highlighted language, it's, this says, unless the Secretary of Energy notifies the committees on approaches, three business days in advance, none of the funds shall happen here. That sort of directive counts as legislation. So if you were trying to accomplish this through an amendment, you wouldn't be able to include that kind of language. So a little distinction there between base text and amendatory language. Then of course, increasingly in appropriations bills, you just get straight up non-appropriations policy. This is just a directive to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, as you can see, it has nothing to do with spending money. And this is, something that authorizers hate on the Hill. This is an example of policy creeping into the appropriations bill, as I suspect, because appropriations bills are the only bills that move anymore, with the exception of NDAA, perhaps a couple of other things. So you will see these in there. They'll be in numbered sections that look more like traditional legislation. Query whether they're supposed to be there, but it is a fact of life that they exist in appropriations bills these days. But now we talk about amendments. These are limited but can be a powerful tool. And this is where you can get into the process, either at the full committee markup stage or on the floor by having a champion offer an amendment on your behalf. That said, there's a 
a limit on the types of amendments that you can offer. So we're going to go through the four most common types that do work for appropriations bills here. You have Clause 2C of House Rule 21 that provides that amendments to general approach bills are not in order if they change existing law. And Clause 4 of Senate Rule 16 provides effectively the same thing. So what does work? Well, historically, bills were considered on an open process on the floor in both houses. Indeed, when I started as a parliamentarian, I was often there all night long as the clerk would read through these big, long appropriations bills. Members would write down amendatory ideas on napkins, and they would stand up at the appropriate moment in the reading of the bill and say, I have an amendment. We'd walk over, we'd look at it, we'd decide whether it fit the rules or not, and then we'd have the chair rule on it in real time. Eventually, that process kind of fell apart um, for political reasons, mostly. Uh, so now the amendment process is more tightly controlled by the Rules Committee and in the Senate by time agreements. As I said before, however, the Rules Committee and typically Senate leadership as they're coming up with time agreements, they look at amendments and they will ask the parliamentarian, hey, if this were offered on the floor under an open process, would this pass muster? Would this be in order? And if the answer is no, then that is a reason for them not to make it in order. Of course, the Rules Committee and Senate leadership also can decide not to make an, an amendment order on policy grounds, and that's why they switched to this way of doing it. But you need to have your procedure sound to even have a chance of getting made in order these days, which is why we're going through this exercise. So these are amendments that will work. Transfers. This is a way to simply move money from one program, one account in the bill to another. It's a great way to signal approval for one program while voicing disapproval for another. It's not a way to transfer money to new programs, though. All you can do is shuffle money between existing accounts in the underlying bill so they can be tough to manage politically. You need to convince the appropriators and in the House, the rule com Rules Committee and the Senate, Senate leadership, not only that one program is underfunded, but also that another program is overfunded, right? Because you're taking from something to build up something else. There are typically operations and management accounts in appropriations bills that target departments, operation, and, and, you know, and, and management capacities. Those are popular targets for these transfer amendments. Um, just bear in mind that these agencies do need some money to carry, about, carry out their ops when you're targeting those accounts. This is an example of a transfer amendment uh, that Ms. Van Berger offered in the 117th Congress. And as you can see, it's as simple as targeting one account on page 245, line six, reducing it by two million, and then plussing up another account elsewhere in the bill. Um, it's just that simple. You do want to run these sorts of amendments by the appropriators and by CB, CBO or have your champ do that for you. Uh, sometimes the numbers <clears throat> won't be exactly the same because some accounts spend, spend out at different rates, but this is effectively how a transfer amendment looks. And then, of course, the most famous type of appropriations amendment, the limitation. These limit the use of funds in appropriations bill. And they're enabled by Clause 2D of House Rule 21 and Clause 2 of Senate Rule 16. These prevent funds in the bill from being used for a particular purpose. But you have to bear in mind there's a prohibition on new legislation that, you know, controls these limitation amendments scope as well. So you need to be using terminology that is set out in law, regulation, or agency guidance when you're writing these limitations. You can't make up new terminology that an agency wouldn't be on notice of what it is. And, and for, for folks that have questions on how to draft more specifically around those sort of things, I, I'm always happy to be a, a resource. Um, but this is sort of what a, a, a standard limitation would look like. Uh, Mr. Nagus offered this a couple of years ago. None of the funds may be used to issue rights away or permits uh, pursuant to this provision of the CFR uh, for this railway. Um, you'll know, if you go to Title 43, Part 2800 of the CFR, the issuance of rights of way and permits will be raised in there explicitly. You're not using any terminology here that the agency that would be carrying out this limitation does not know. So limitations always in order. Just make sure you're using language that is established in law, regulation, or guidance. Number three, uh, I call this the treasure of the Sierra Madre of appropriations amendments. These are the hardest ones to draft. These are new appropriations. In narrow circumstances, you can add a new appropriation to a general appropriations bill by amendment. But that purpose that you're funding needs to be specifically authorized in law for the fiscal year that you're targeting, and you can't exceed the amount 
for which it's authorized in law. Uh, so it's rare for an amendment of this type to pass muster. And the Senate has further rules that require the referral of four amendments of this type to its Committee on Appropriations, where they're subject to a point of order. That said, oh, why can't I advance my slide? Let's go. There we go. Um, that said, a couple of years ago, Mr. Panetta offered this amendment. Um, so NRDC helped work on this one. I believe this is the first amendment of this type that had been done in quite a long time. But this transferred uh, $2 million from an operations and maintenance account in the transport bill over to a program that provided uh, activities to benefit pollinators on roadsides and high rights of way under a particular provision of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act um, that was codified in Title 23 here. The reason this worked is because in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, there was an authorization for the fiscal year that this applied to of $2 million, and it said, very specifically, to carry out activities to benefit pollinators on roadsides and a highway rights of way under this particular provision of law. So if you go to 23 USC 332, you'll see that precise language there, and you'll see an authorization for $2 million for fiscal year 24, which is, I believe, the year this was. Um, so the parliamentarian's office definitely called me after they saw this one and said, you did this, didn't you? And I said, yes, yes, I did. Um, very hard to do, but if you can pull it off, it's a way to get money to a program that otherwise would not get it at all. So important to know. And finally, I think this is the unsung hero of appropriations amendments, strikes. This is the way to eliminate language that you don't like in an appropriations bill. And the great thing about strike amendments is they're essentially always in order. Um, I can't tell you how many conversations I had in the parliamentarian's office with people who are coming up with complicated limitation amendments, trying to, you know, kneecap some provision earlier in the bill that they really didn't like. And uh, usually the upshot of all of these conversations, all these machinations, I say, so wait, you're targeting something in the bill here that you don't like, why don't you just strike it? And they're like, oh yeah. Generally speaking, you can only strike one provision per amendment, but you can strike words, lines, even entire sections that you don't like. So just remember that this is a tool in your toolbox when you see something appear in an appropriations bill that you hate and see if you can get a chance to help you strike it. And that's what one looks like. Ms. Crockett did not like section 454, whatever bill this was, HR 4821. That's all you have to do. Uh, let me say, strikes are my personal favorite, easy to draft. You don't have to argue whether they're in order or not. This is the way to get things done in the easiest manner possible. Um, let's take a minute to talk about report language, though. It's the next best thing to bill text. But getting affirmative bill text, as I've said, really hard to do. Oftentimes, it's a multi-year process of socializing idea, developing champs, building up a base of support. Report language, lower bar to clear. So, as I said, when the appropriations committees mark up their general approach bills, report them for floor consideration, they also promulgate these committee reports that expand upon the legislative intent behind the bills, right? So in doing this, there are directives to the officials charged with spending the money in the bills that, you know, further specify particular programs and projects for which money should be spent. And they also provide legislative type directions to those official, uh, officials. So here's an example from the energy and water bill, right, of a couple of years ago. Uh, this is Department of Energy line. It's, it's $3.8 billion top line for the energy efficiency and renewable energy program. And all the bill contained that particular year was a $245 million subaccount for program direction. That seems to afford an awful lot of leeway for DOE to spend that money, right? Well, no, because when you go to the committee report, there are, you know, there are more instructions there as to how that money should be spent. It further subdivides the uh, $3.8 billion. Look here, you've got $20 million for the uh, technology to market sub community subprogram. You've got $5 million for stakeholder engagement capacity building. You can get these directives and committee reports a lot easier than you can get instructions in a bill itself. So another form of report language of interest is just a standalone instruction. They often are set up by subject matter and they provide affirmative policy instructions to offices and programs. You'll be able to identify them in the committee reports because they'll have these little italicized subtitles that set out what they're all about. Now, 
Some standalone instructions are accompanied by funding directions or recommendations. This was $520 million for the Vehicle Technologies Office. Again, this is all just in the committee report. Nowhere in this year's bill would you find the VTO. Other instructions espouse policies that are merely funding adjacent, like the university training and research language here. And others like the ethane study that you see are just legislative instructions that are completely unrelated to funding. So you have a lot more room to work with in committee reports. Clause 2C of House Rule 21, Clause 2 of Senate Rule 16, they don't apply to the contents of these committee reports. Uh, so you have a lot more room to maneuver on getting your priorities sort of uh, officially enshrined, right? Now, folks who are seasoned legislative advocates probably have alarm bells going off. It, are, isn't committee report language typically non-binding? The answer is yes. But report language often is incorporated into general appropriations bills, legislative text by reference, first of all. So here's an example in the energy and water bill of that year that expressly incorporated the contents of its committee report into hard black letter law. But even when that doesn't happen, report language often is treated as binding by the officials who are charged with administering the funding to the appropriations bills themselves absent some sort of countervailing legislative instruction, right? The folks in the executive branch who are carrying, who are spending this money want to have good relations with the appropriators, right? So they don't want to flaunt their legislative directives uh, willy-nilly. And so oftentimes these are just taken as law. Um, so as I say, because getting base text into general bills can be arduous, a multi-year pro process, committee report language is a great alternative. How do you do it? Well, of course, even committee report language can be tough to get. You want to have an interested member of Congress in your corner to put you on your best footing. So to facilitate requests for this kind of language, the Approps Committee has established a process where individual members can submit requests for funding or for policy priorities in the annual appropriations bills. Literally, the, the Senate and the House each have these proprietary databases, the appropriations committees, where members of Congress or their staff go in and write in particular requests for report language they want to see. Um, also for bill language, but report language is much more common request. So, getting a member or multiple members to submit such a request on your priorities behalf is a, the best way to get it before the appropriators. How does this work? It's a little more scattershot, classic Congress. Every member, House or Senate, is going to have their own request form system through their, usually through their member website, right? So you request to them through this public forum that they offer, and then they submit the request through the proprietary appropriations committee uh, request process. So the more members you can get for submitting an identical, identical request on your behalf, and then if you can get a dear colleague letter and get those members to sign on to it, build momentum behind your priority, that's the best way to get your product either into a bill or even more likely into a committee report. You just have to note that there are annual deadlines to make requests to members. And because member office deadlines are sort of all over the place, each member office controls their own deadline. You really have to be on top of it, checking their website, checking, you know, it, it varies from member office to member office. Some members, famously Senator Schatz of Hawaii, they don't love getting a ton of these requests, so they'll set their deadline like three days after the process is announced. Others will keep it open for months. Just stay on top of your deadlines. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about a good way to do that in a second. As we wind down towards the end of the presentation here, let's just touch on the schedule, what happens when and why it matters. Here's the model time frame: In February through April, that's usually when you'll see those member personal office deadlines. Um, this year, a little bit different, you know, we didn't get funding for fiscal year 24 until March. And so obviously it wasn't until March that those member deadlines started cropping up and they ran until May. But model time frame here in March and April is usually when the subcommittees have their deadlines for programmatic requests. Those are those requests that I talked about, talk about that the members will be submitting to the subcommittees on your behalf. And then in March and April, April, there are also community project funding or earmark deadlines. Uh, you may have a particular earmark project that you care about, no judgment here. Um, and those deadlines support to note around that same time frame. Uh, in April and May, that's when you're going to see the subcommittee and full committee bill markups that we talked about initially. The subcommittee and committee markups typically are a week or so apart. And then in June and July, that's traditionally when floor consideration of these bills occurs. Uh, floor consideration 
typically takes place a week after the full committee markup to the extent it happens at all. I understand that some of these bills never are considered, but we're talking about the model time from here. September is when, in theory, the House and Senate resolve the differences between their bills and the appropriations bills become law. This usually is accomplished through the cobbling together of an omnibus package or conference between the houses. The fiscal year expires at midnight on September the 30th. So if the general bills are not enacted by that time, that's when you need a CR to avoid a shutdown. That's what we got this year. Um, the present CR runs through December the 20th. So you can expect those omnibus negotiations to crank into high gear post-election late November, early December, in order to meet that deadline. Now, of course, if you're a busy advocate, it's tough to keep track of all this, especially if a purpose is only a part of your portfolio. For those who are working in the environmental space, there is an environmental appropriations coalition that exists. It's here to help. It's a helpful convening space on all things of IRO approach. Uh, I do a yearly lecture series where I give a chat that's very similar to this, but I also have more advanced amendment drafting and so forth conversations. Uh, so let me know if you want to get involved there and I could reach out to the folks who moderate that group. Um, one example of a service they provide is not only just regular calls where we share intel, but also we have a crowdsourced spreadsheet every year where we track the various member deadlines for the submissions of appropriations requests. So you have like the links to those request forms and the deadlines all in one place. So just, just a plug for that group. I found them very helpful since I came over to the NGO side. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. That's the intro to approach. So we've got some time for some Q&A. I will stop sharing my screen for that purpose so I can actually see what's going on here. And uh, yeah, I hope that was helpful and not boring. Kyle, that was so cool. But you knew I was going to think it was so cool because I already thought your parliamentarian job was so cool. So I have some questions for you that have come in uh, as you've been speaking. And I want to I want to just kind of run through them as fast as we as we can, because you sure. gave us a lot to think about. Um, now that we all speak the language of appropriations, we can we can get into it. I'd like to get to a, a really kind of practical question. You talked about the schedule just now um, and how, in theory, president's budget comes out in February, in theory, um, then subcommittees mark up and then the committees mark up. Well, we're in October, almost November. Mm -hmm. We are currently under a continuing resolution. So Congress hasn't finished the appropriations process for fiscal year 25. Is it too late for organizations to have an impact on fiscal year 25? And while you're thinking about that, the flip side of that is, is it too early for people to start thinking about fiscal year 26? Okay. Well, let's start with fiscal year 25. Context is key there, but the, the general answer is, it, it, no, it's not too late for your organizations to have an impact. It's just a question of what it is you're impacting. If you're trying to generate funding for a new, uh, you know, for a new initiative or come up with report language from whole cloth. Yeah, it's probably too late for fiscal year 25 to start that process. But if you want to start weighing in now on top line spending levels, ensuring that your program, your bill gets the most possible chunk of change under the spending caps that were set out in the Fiscal Responsibility Act, you know, generating group letters, getting members of Congress to sign on to dear colleague letters to talk about maintaining optimal spending levels. We have two sets of dueling spending bills out there, right? We have Senate bills. We have, um, you know, the, the House bills. It, what I find to be a helpful exercise and what I plan to do in November is to go through those dueling sets of bills and point to things to the negotiators who are going to be talking bicamerally towards the end of the year and say, I really like what the Senate did here. You should preserve this. I love what's in this House report less likely in my case, but it's possible. I love what's in this house report. Please preserve that language. We fought hard to include it. So as this year end package comes together, try to leverage the work that's already been done to generate the best outcome for yourself. For fiscal year 26, the work that you can be doing right now is particularly if you have a program that um, has a disproportionate impact in a particular state or congressional district, now is as good a time as any to set up those initial conversations with the offices of members who are interested in those programs to say, hey, I want to highlight this thing that's really important to you in Minneapolis or really important to you in Bismarck um, and really have a great impact on your community. So committee report language and the T-HUD bill for fiscal year 
26th could make all the difference in either making sure this is funded or making sure it's implemented correctly. When the time comes, we're, you know, we want to submit, we want you to submit a request on this program's behalf. We want to help you come up with a way to draft it so that you're not, you know, one of a thousand people trying to break through in that week before the appropriations deadlines, you know, are due for the member requests and, you know, for fiscal year 26. You can start laying the groundwork for that kind of program uh, right now. And also, I would say, as I mentioned before, you do have that debt limit uh, deadline coming up on January the 1st. Uh, if you are an organization who is inclined to be anti-spending cap, as I imagine many on this call are, you want to start raising your hand right now and say, hey, please don't sign out, to sign off on a raising or suspension of the debt limit that is accompanied by these draconian spending caps that will inhibit all of our programs going forward. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to be effective right now on both fronts. That's terrific, Kyle. I think that's that's really helpful. I mean, obviously, it's it's too late to completely start something new for FY25, but there are proposals out there for 25 that are still being discussed. So we still have the opportunity to have some impact and let our voices be heard on sure. that, as well as developing those relationships for FY26. You alluded actually in that to meeting with members of Congress, identifying your priorities for FY26. I do want to say that earmarks or community directed projects or community funded directed funding or however they're referred to now mm -hmm. those specific line items that go to specific projects in specific communities have made a comeback in the transportation bill and others but for our purposes in the transportation bill in the senate bill we've seen you know a, over a billion dollars directed to earmarks on on roadways um you know half a half a billion directed to earmarks for transit projects so that's a significant potential source of funding for individual community uh, desires. Given that, I think it's fair to say many of the folks on this call are not the transit agency or the city department of transportation, but are rather advocacy groups who are interested in seeing certain projects advance, but aren't necessarily the, the uh, government agency that's going to advance them. Can you talk a little bit about what role... Um, you know, a, an advocacy organization, a local community might play and how we can kind of connect the dots from our desires there to getting an earmark into a final bill. Well, I mean, that's, you're starting to make a great point there, which is, you know, I obviously come from a major national, international even NGO, but there are a lot of priorities for which a local organization is a lot more effective. And that, that is, and one area where, where you can be a lot more impactful and effective is when you are trying to get a particular earmarked project accomplished. And if, when you're from that district, when you're from that city, you can have these meetings, for example, with whatever city council or, 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 or city agency and say, hey, there's this federal money out there or this possibility of this federal program having a big impact on the work you do. We want you to be contacting our local legislator, you know, on all of our, you know, behalves and, and making the point about how important this, you know, getting this bucket of infrastructure law spending or IRA spending directed to us, you need to be making that case to our member of Congress. And if I'm from that local organization, I'd want to be doing the same thing, you know, in addition to meeting with the, the, the city officials and having them make that case to the legislature. Um, I would want to make, a, I would want to set up a sign on letter and get as many local stakeholders as possible to sign on to it and submit it up you know, to the member of Congress that I'm trying to get to submit a request on our behalf. And that kind of advocacy can be so impactful. And a lot of times if I'm in, you know, flying with the mothership NRDC, maybe we have more purchase on, you know, top line efforts or some sort of broader piece of legislation. But boy, on those earmark efforts or those community specific things, they want to be hearing from you, not from us. Um, that is, I'm not saying we can't be effective in that space too. I'm not, don't want to sell us short, but boy, I, I just want to underscore how effective y'all can be. Um, you'll, you'll know the local officials you know, better than anyone else. You'll know the, the actors. And you'll be able to influence the legislators in a way that major national groups can't. That's terrific, terrific advice. And, and as you noted before, now that the earmark process has sort of come back into play, the members of Congress have a process for taking those earmark requests. So once you've got that local coalition supporting that project, you need to contact the member of Congress and pay attention to their deadlines too. As Kyle was saying, these deadlines can come up fast for some members. Some are a little more flexible, but there are there are deadlines involved in this process. 
And he I didn't even put to... Senator shots on blast. He's just uh, one dude. He's... Loves to set his deadline like 24 hours out. I no, there are I respect plenty of others. I'm, I'm not trying to crush him, but <laughs> and definitely he, if you gonna... have something for him, <laughs> take note. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about spending. And it, it happens sometimes that, particularly in the case of earmarks, where maybe some money is directed to a an organization, a, a city or a community, and they actually don't use it in the time frame that they have to use it, or some funds from a program don't get expended. Um, and so by the time the next appropriation bill rolls around, or a few appropriations bills later, you've got some money kind of sitting in the federal treasury that had been had been appropriated for a purpose, but hasn't been spended, expended. Um, is there a possibility of kind of clawing that money back and using it for another purpose? Yeah, well, as you see, it'll still be sitting in the treasury, but if it, if it was sunsetted by the, the appropriations bill, as most funding like that is, they'll say you have until September 30th, uh, in this case, 2025, to spend that amount of money. You need to make the case again for that. You need to make the case again for that locality to get the money. So. If, if you notice that you are nearing the end of the fiscal year and your local officials or your local program hasn't expended these monies that are available to them, you have to start making the case publicly say, hey, the, the, the folks worked hard to get you this amount of money. It, it can disappear. And if the appropriators notice that you, you don't care enough to spend it, um, they might be disinclined to reallocate that money to you again, whether for this purpose or for another one. So. Um, yeah, clawbacks, clawbacks of money after the fiscal deadline, that could be tough. The only other thing I would say is that uh, you could obligate money without actually spending it, and then they can't claw that money back at the end of fiscal year. So you can enter into a contract where that money can be spent. That money is considered out the door, even if you haven't actually spent it. But for goodness sake, yeah, start obligating money as quickly well, as quickly, yeah. So that's the that's for for communities that have an earmark and are trying to figure out how to spend it before the deadline. And if you don't, you got to kind of get that re re given to you. But I guess there can also be situations where there's a program that just hasn't had as many subscribers as it, they thought it would, or something like that, where potentially that funding could be used for a purpose that maybe we would like. But yeah, it sounds sure. like this this sort of thing does happen, and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing depends on where you sit, whether you were the recipient of the funding, what it was going to be used for, et cetera. Yeah. Um, let's turn a little bit. I want to comment just for a moment on, Kyle, what you were saying about spending caps, because Kyle reminded uh, us that there is going to be another debate about the debt limit and kind of spending and everything that comes with that early in the new year or late in this year, depending on how things work out. Um, the, for many of us on this call, we are particularly interested in some of the transportation programs that the bipartisan infrastructure law created that are funded with general funds. So these are things, um, that things like the, the transit capital investment grant program that builds new transit projects, the active transportation infrastructure investment program that connects our, um, you know, trails networks, these sorts of things are funded with general funds, which means they would be subjected to any kind of spending cap or across the board cut or things like that. And that stems from the way that these programs were set up in their authorizing bill, the bipartisan infrastructure law. So the transportation programs that come from the highway trust fund that are funded with gas taxes tend not to be quite as much at risk because they have their own funding source, gas taxes, and they pay for it. So they, they're not quite as much at risk in general. Is there something we should be thinking about during the authorization process, the legislative drafting process that creates these programs that can help protect them later in the appropriations process? Boy, I mean, short of getting a direct appropriation and some programs in the bipartisan inf infrastructure law were doled out money as the bill was enacted. I mean, I guess that's the, that's the gold standard for what you want to try and accomplish. Right. Um, short of that, <laughs> I mean, getting a program enshrined into mandatory spending obviously is another gold standard goal, but that, that is nigh impossible to do in, in this day and age. Um, hmm. I would say, making sure that your authorization window goes out as far as possible. 
Because if you have a fiscal year where you have strong political headwinds, you don't want your authorizations to expire such that when the political climate is going your way again, um, you know, you no longer have an active authorization. So um, I would say authorizations to go out as far as seven to 10 years, like that's kind of, that's the gold standard. If you get something that's just off, authorized for a couple of fiscal years and you just don't have the right alignment in Congress or in the White House to see those priorities be funded, it's a lot harder when you don't have an active authorization. Um, so I would say duration of authorization in that circumstance, if you can't get mandatory spending or, or a direct appropriation in your in, in, in the authorization bill that you're that you're working on, I'd say duration of duration of spending would be the, the big one for me. And actually, I appreciate that. And I would actually just add on, on my own behalf that I think also ha making sure that whoever gets it in the authorizing bill, your champion in that context is prepared to remain your champion in the appropriations context every year, because Great. somebody who gets it into that first bill and then says, okay, I'm done, hasn't really completed the job. So that's another thing. Sure. We're running low on time. I do want to give you one more question, Kyle. Yep. For those who are on the call, you know, maybe just getting involved in the appropriations process, just learning it through, um, or maybe coming from different communities around the country. Do do folks, do you think that folks have to develop like a specialized expertise or you know, special relationships or something to to really make a difference in the appropriations process? Like, is it only a, a, a specialized group of folks who can who can do this? Or can all of us really do this? What do you think? We can all we can all do it as long as you understand the, the fundamentals of, of, of how the process works. The timeline for engagement that we talked about here, I think, is the key. Uh, if, if you have an urgent priority that needs funding and you start advocating on its behalf in July, you will have missed the member request process you're talking about, uh, that we've been talking about. Um, if, if, if you don't know about the member request process and you're just willy nilly reaching out to appropriators, uh, you can find that to be a tough, you know, a tough wall to crack through. Whereas if you have this general understanding, you don't necessarily have to know how to draft appropriations language. You don't necessarily have to know, the difference between 302A and 302B. You just need to have a strong champion from your district. So as long as you have that basic understanding of when to engage, the general parameters of what you can ask for. So you're not asking for the moon, you're asking for a funding level or a port language directive. I think a basic understanding and you're in great footing. I think that that's, you know, hopefully these slides can be helpful for that. Uh, to that. That's right. That's very helpful, Kyle. Thank you so much for your expertise and sharing that with us today. I do want to remind everyone that we are going to be sharing the slides as well as the recording of the webinar and information about the envi environmental, now I've forgotten the name of it, coalition. Environmental Appropriations Coalition. That, I imagine if that Kyle mentioned we'll be sharing that information as well. Thank you so much to everyone for hanging in there with us today on the appropriations process. I, I hope you all found it as fascinating as I did. So have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in. Well, thanks. Thanks for the nice comments. I really appreciate it. Take care.